Hello, I'm Mark Steiner. Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. Good to have you all with us. You know, I never really thought about the arc of racism and water until covering this disaster in Jackson, Mississippi. This devastating arc between the water infrastructure disaster in Jackson, Mississippi, water poisoning in Flint, Michigan, and the avoidable disaster in the wake of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans and how deeply connected they are. The waters that sickened, drowned, and left communities devastated were let loose by the racist neglect that permeates political power in this country. So once again, we return to Jackson, Mississippi. We're joined by Vangela M. Wade, who's president and CEO of the Mississippi Center for Justice, a nonprofit public interest law firm committed to advancing racial and economic justice, a group that's taking on the struggle legally to the powers that be, which are in many ways the living legacy of the embodiment of segregation that preceded it, and working with communities to fight racism and for an equitable society in one of the most, I hate to say, backward states in the country, Mississippi. And uh, it's interesting that this is about the same time that Katrina exploded, that we saw what happened in Jackson. And Vajela M. Wade, welcome. Good to have you with us. Great. Thank you, Mark. Uh, um, and I, w- I will say, you know, certainly Mississippi has its has its many shortcomings. It you does. Know, we're on the bottom bottom of every uh, of the worst list of, of social indicators and at the top of the worst list of, of social indicators such as health, education, you know, economics, um, you know, criminal justice. Uh, but, um, you know, we do, there are people here who are fighting the fight, uh, people here who have made strides and significant changes. So, you know, we are, we are fighting to move past some of the uh, stigma uh, that Mississippi uh, has has uh, perpetuated, uh, you know, for 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 years. So we we uh, have some backwards uh, leadership mm-hmm. in certain areas, but we certainly have very progressive. Um, you know, we have communities that are very progressive, and we have people who are leading organizations similar to Mississippi Center for Justice uh, that are just as progressive and who are. Um, you know, making sustainable change uh, in Mississippi. Very well said, and I, I agree. And I, I was just, I suppose sometimes just it gets, as it must to you and many others, it just gets to you sometimes about how crazy it is. I mean, when you have this governor who's saying, well, it's Jackson's fault. They didn't put the money into this place. And then you have, as you wrote about, people who are taking the money that was meant to help people being kind of stolen by the wealthy and squandered. I mean, those situations are just maddening. They're insane. You're exactly right. Uh, you know, what we try to do is try to keep our eye, you know, we try to keep our eyes and in, in the focus forward because we do realize that, for instance, with regards to the the resources that are allocated uh, from the from state leadership uh, in, in many instances when it comes to not only Jackson, but other uh, uh, majority Black uh, municipalities that, uh, those those municipalities, those those communities aren't always getting their equitable share of the resources, uh, particularly the resources that are, you know, even given whether it's through uh, TANF funds or whether it's through, uh, you know, the recent relief, uh, various relief uh, funds. And so those are particular areas that we're going to continue to keep eye to, to keep our eyes on uh, in the event that we may need to uh, you know, to to determine if there's some some action that should be taken, as we did with Katrina. You know, we had to go to bat for Black people uh, on the Mississippi Gulf Coast who were not given their equitable share or heck, uh, hardly even a share okay, right. <laughs> uh, to uh, following Katrina uh, to make repairs to their homes um, as compared to those homes that were on on the beach. Uh, it, you know, they were owned by majority white uh, citizens, the black citizens were left left out, um, not only left, left out of their homes by Katrina and that, that devastation, but also by the state government until uh, M- the Mississippi Center for Justice went in to fight that battle. Uh, so we, we are here uh, for the people of this state, for our stakeholders. And when we see an injustice, uh, we will do our best to make uh, to, to make a change. You know, and it does seem just for a moment, as you were speaking, I was thinking about how, while this was going on, we were recording on our side here in Baltimore, Maryland. Mm-hmm. And just two weeks ago, we had the same scare 
on the west side of town, the majority black community, where there was E. coli in the water or what's happening in Newark or Flint or across the country. I mean, this is not, I think people need to be able to connect these dots and say, understand what is really happening here to the poorest and blackest communities in America when it comes to our water infrastructure and poisoning of our children and families. I mean, this is, this it's a very serious problem. But you're exactly right. And and with, you know, it's it's a rippling effect. Uh, and it's not just, uh, you know, it makes, it, it it's not just an infrastructure issue. It becomes a health a healthcare issue. And ultimately it becomes, you know, an education issue. Uh, it's an economic issue. So, you know, it may, what may start out as, as the, the the municipalities or the the local communities not receiving their equitable share of resources from the state, uh, it ends up impacting the citizens uh, in, in a way that will take decades to overcome. And when you're looking at situations such as the city of Jackson's water current water crisis, that is not that current. It's something that's been ongoing for you know, more than 50 years now. And it's just come to, as we say in the, you know, in the South, it's just come to a head at this point. And of course, all eyes are focused on Jackson. But as you mentioned, there was Flint, Baltimore. There are other areas that have similar similar infrastructure issues, similar uh, issues where the, citizen, the citizens in those municipalities are being poisoned uh, by, by, by water. Uh, we're, you know, certainly concerned about the amount of lead that's in the water here in Jackson, but that could be said for uh, small uh, towns in the Mississippi Delta as well. Uh, again, those areas areas being pr uh, primarily African American, and so it. While we don't want to say that everything is related to race and discrimination, sometimes the you know <laughs> it it it. It, it's just there. It, it's there, and 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 it's the obvious connection. But what we're looking at now is is uh, you know I guess the the immediate issue, of course, is the water crisis in Jackson. Uh, what we should all start to focus on is how what will it take to to correct this situation or to make this situation better for the people, the people who are depending on not only the the local. Uh, leadership, but the state leadership to actually lead. And we're finding that that's not happening. And so we also then have to start and we have to look at the long-term impact uh, and long-term uh, solutions. And it, quite frankly, it's it's uh, uh, we don't have a lot of hope at this point uh, in, in the same people um, doing the same thing and uh, seemingly as though they're expecting a different uh, a different outcome. So with everybody, with all the media's eyes and the tension and the cameras and the microphones in Jackson, at this point, we're hoping that the that the attention will be a lasting attention, so that uh, the people who are most responsible for for leading will do just that and will bring uh, some change to the citizens of, of Jackson, Mississippi. Now, I, I want to come back to the political the political issues that you face in Mississippi in this struggle here around water and more in this particular moment. But I'm just curious, at this moment of our taping, um, what I've read is that the water pressure is back on, but the water is still not fit to drink. Am I right? That's, that's what I am understanding as well. And, you know, certainly for, uh, we have... Uh, have received substantial uh, outpouring of help all around the city uh, from people coming near and far and bringing water. Uh, but you know, certainly, uh, you, you know that's that's wonderful, and we're we're, we're so humble by that. But we got to look forward to, the, to and know that eventually, uh, well, hope that eventually the leadership will do what it takes to make the repairs. Uh, to bring the water quality to where it is something that's not uh, uh, that's not basically the same as a, a third world country. Uh, we have to worry about our children and the water that they're drinking and how that's going to impact their health as well as our elderly uh, citizens who are um, impacted by this by this water crisis as well. So there is a rippling effect, and uh, we're we're hoping that. Uh, change will will come very soon. 
So, I mean, I, I, I was thinking about what the governor, Governor Reeves, said. He told city leaders that they needed to do a better job collecting their water bill payments before they start going and asking everyone else to pony up more money. And at the same time, he's the same governor who vetoed what I was a bipartisan legislation that would provide a relief to poor residents saying he doesn't agree with the idea of calling it free money. So right. w- talk about what, so when you're up against that kind of political mindset, that kind of human mindset, societal mindset, what do you do? I mean, how are you confronting that? How are you addressing that? How are you dealing with that? I mean, that's got to be difficult. Yeah, to say yeah, the least. Exactly right. <laughs> and it's not, it's not something that we're, that, uh, you know, that's new for us, you know, that type of rhetoric. Uh, it's unfortunate, and, and I think it's more it, it's it's more of a political uh, approach to a real you know to real problems, and it's a way to deflect uh, the state's uh, lack of of oversight or lack of of, of engagement in the capital city. Uh, so you know when when comments such as such as those are made. Uh, you know, we, there's, you, you can't do anything about what a person will say, but right. then, you know, what we, what we are hoping is that, uh, you know, people will exercise their, their right to, to vote, uh, privilege to vote and make a change at the ballot box uh, at, 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 to change the people who are in charge of making the decisions about allocating resources and who, who receives those resources and how those resources are allocated. That's where the that's where we need to spend our time or our focus is not worrying about, you know, the the, the <laughs> political rhetoric. Right. But focusing on voting. And if we if people would go out to if they would vote, regardless of who they're voting for, you know, I've recently been reminded that we must always be, you know, nonpartisan. Uh, but uh, regardless of who <laughs> they're voting for, uh, they need to exercise that vote. Uh, looking at the resources that are coming in and out of their communities and if they're receiving their equitable share of those resources. So if, if, um, you know, whether it's the governor or whomever it may be, uh, if they want to spend their time and focus on ridiculous statements and, uh, you know, comments such as that, then so be it. But the people uh, should be heard and they should be heard at the ballot. So a couple of questions here. One, I'm curious more about the Mississippi Center for Justice. Um, you, you seem like you're like um, a number of legal agencies I've been associated with a bit in the past are rolled into one in terms of the work that you do. So to talk about how you're, how, what you're doing as an organization to address what's happening at this moment. Right. Well, you know, as you mentioned early on, our uh, the Mississippi Center for Justice is a nonprofit public interest law firm. We're the only uh, nonprofit public, public interest law firm homegrown in the state. And our focus is not only on uh, advocacy, but also direct services, impact litigation, as, as well as policy. And at this, uh, you know, at this, with this particular, uh, what we call a, um, uh, I guess this is a quasi man made uh, natural disaster. You right. know, certainly the, the floods. With the, the floods were the imp- was the impetus to this current uh, focus on the water crisis, uh, but governments, the state, the city's failure to collaborate, failure to uh, allocate uh, resources was a, what I would say is a man-made disaster, right? Uh, so at this point, we're doing what other organizations are doing. We're focusing on immediate need of uh, providing uh, in coalition resources, you know, for the community. We're also looking at our, at you know, some mid mid level or midterm type of of, of um, solutions. And uh, also, uh, without saying, you know, sa- you know, saying a lot or saying uh, giving away strategy or plans, mm-hmm. we are also looking at uh, some of the long term issues to determine if there if there's additional if, uh, actions that we need to take. So it's all on the table. <laughs> all on the table. So 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 it, we, I was thinking about what Mayor Chakwe Lumumba was saying, it would take billions to fix the immediate problem, even more to fix the long-term issues. They've just passed this $1.2 trillion um, bill in Congress around infrastructure. 
The question is, you know, how that helps Jackson. I mean, if the money is going through the state of Mississippi, there's no telling what what Jackson will get or not get, how little it might get. And, and why can't Jackson get the money directly from the federal government? What kind of efforts are being made to kind of control the funding coming in so you can actually put people to work, change the infrastructure, and, and get that done? Um, because if you listen to the governor of that state, the money coming in, um, a, as we used to say, I bet you a dollar to a donut, that money is not going to Jackson. So, so, so tell me about that kind of what's happening with that and whatever role you're playing in that. Well, um, I, I will just say with, with regards to that, certainly we're not around, you know, those tables that that's way above my pay grade with regards <laughs> to, to the, uh, you know, the uh, how it, how, you know, the system for, uh, of allocation from federal government through the state uh, and down, down to uh, the city of Jackson. But I, I, what I will say is that uh, it, to me, in my opinion, you know, rolling the money, the funds out, uh, directly through the state and hoping that a state such as, you know, a Mississippi uh, with the issue, with the systemic issues and history of discrimination uh, in, in play seems a little ridiculous. And it's, and it's similar to when you have block money that comes through the federal government uh, to states through basically block grants, which, which is what happened with the, uh, with the tenant funds. And then the states are able to, the state and the governor able to decide how that money is to be distributed and whether or not it actually gets to those to those that it was intended is a different uh, is a you know is a different issue. So at this point again we're focusing on the immediate assistance that we can provide and then looking at um, the issues and the, the impact on the community to determine if there are other uh, other actions that need to that we need to be focused on similar to what we focused on during Katrina, when we did realize that funds were not being distributed um, as it should, for the folks who needed it most, and eventually had, you know, that resulted in litigation. So not saying that that is what we're, you know, specifically doing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I am saying that 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 it, it is all on the table gotcha. uh, as it becomes appropriate. Right. But, but you are a legal organization, so if litigation is necessary, you're there. We could, we could be there. <laughs> so I, I'm, I wonder if you, I was thinking about what you just said as well, and, and if you could give people a sense of what it is like for the people in Jackson at this moment, um, just in terms of surviving around water and water issues. And, and we know that there's this whole arc in America where in communities of color are always in the most dangerous, disastrous position when it comes to to to, uh, to situations like this. But so talk about what what is it like day to day for you, for other people in Mrs. in Jackson at this moment? Well, with regards to uh, you know many people in Jackson who are experiencing this current and trying to live through this current crisis with not having uh, water running through you know, their faucets um, for cooking or, you know, to drink a glass of water with medicine or to to take a, a bath or a shower without worrying about, uh, you know, uh, dangerous bacteria or whatever else is in the water. Uh, it, you know, it's 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 not easy, as you pointed out. It's not it's it's not easy uh, sometimes being the at the bottom of the of the of the barrel with regards to resources, uh, so you know the citizens in Jackson are doing what what I've seen them do best over the last twenty years that I've lived in this area. They're fighting through. They're fighting through the issues. They're fighting through the challenges because they've got to go to work. They've got to raise their children. You know they've they've got to take care of their of the elderly. Uh, we, we've got to educate. We've got to life continues not notwithstanding the challenge of the current water crisis. So I, I, I would, I'd say that, and then I, I, I really, with realizing the fight that the people in Jackson are, are, are pushing through, uh, I say that, and I am imploring those in leadership, from the governor, lieutenant governor, speaker, those in the legislature, be they black or white, 
um, and the local, uh, the mayor, the city council, whomever it is that's in that these people who are who were voted in, who were given the responsibility to to lead. I am asking that they do just that, that they lead and make those decisions uh, in the best interest of the people, not in the best interest of political party and not in the best interest of continuing systemic uh, uh, discrimination uh, or injustice uh, to hold up an ideology. So, uh, you know, the people in Jackson are pushing forward. They're receiving all of the wonderful help with regards to the water and other resources that are allowing them to go through their daily lives. Uh, and we're hoping that uh, things will get, that the water system will be repaired uh, over time and the water will be uh, become drinkable and uh, they will be able to push at least that challenge uh, behind them and move forward with, uh, with their lives. I mean, yeah, because for those of us who just turn on the faucet and drink the water, to, uh, to think about what it would be like to have to boil your water, find water, get bottled water, take care of your children, make sure they don't get sick. I mean, that right. it, 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 that that's it's like living. It, it's like we're creating um, the worst conditions you would imagine in a developing nation, as opposed to being in the United States of America. Exactly, and and when you think about that, and you think about that in terms of, of certainly, you know, people who are elderly or people who are living with with illnesses or disabilities and they're not able to get out and about to go stand in the the you know long lines to get a case of water to take home to to use for bathing for you know for eating for drinking uh, you know that that makes it even even uh, just more ridiculous that we're in this country in 2022 and this is the issue that is taking the headlines so what does it take or can it what would it take to get president biden and the federal government to give the money directly to jackson mississippi to redevelop its infrastructure put people to work and change and, and i mean it's it cuz the infrastructure is crumbling in, across the entire nation lead pipes all it's it's crumbling in jackson i've talked to folks there and, and it says literally the pipe is crumbling in people's hands literally mm -hmm. crumbling so what does it take what would it take to get the money directly to the hands of a, of a, of of jackson mississippi to do the work themselves without having to go through um the capital down the street yeah well uh, again, that one is above my above my pay grade, uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I'm sure that the mayor of Jackson, uh, the city council, they're probably wondering, this, trying, trying to figure out the same that's answer that same question. Why can't the monies be sent directly to to the place to the to those who need it, those who are going to be responsible for implementing? Uh, so that I can't, you know, that's the way that that's the system as it as it is. We just hope that once the money is sent through the state, that there is an equitable distribution uh, from the state through to the city to make these repairs. Now that there's money coming in from, you know, not only the, you know, certainly the uh, from FEMA, the uh, federal government, uh, you know, of course there was the infrastructure monies uh, that were already being delivered. And it, it is, it, we are hopeful that that money can be, will be used in a way that will address the city's problem. Because it's not a, and let me say, because I don't want, it's not, a, you know, when, when we look at this issue, we need to make sure that we're seeing the people that are being impacted. So it's not just, you know, it's, it's not a city, but it's a community. It's the community that's, that's suffering as a result of the failures, uh, the failure from the state level, uh, and, this, and you know possibly uh, the the failures uh, at the city level because this goes back you know years. Right. So uh, what the people who who are harmed the most are those that are have entrusted, regardless of whether you know the money's coming from the federal straight to the city or through the state. The people who are being harmed the most are the people who put that tr their trust in in the leadership, the current leadership, uh, at all at at these various levels. So I'm curious as, as we conclude. So I'm, in your center, um, you 
were in the middle of a lot of the work um, to make sure things were right in rehabilitating things after Katrina. So what is your role now? What are you doing in, in, in Jackson? What, what steps are you all taking to address and deal with this, whether it's on an organizing level in the community or legally in terms of, of fighting it in the courts? Right. We are working in, in collaboration, in coalition with other social justice organizations and community organizations to help provide uh, resources. And we are also in uh, working with, with groups to, to look at more um, intermediate and long-term um, solutions. So that's where that's where we are now. And these, you know, these things, what I've seen over the last few weeks, mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, what I call a, you know, it's evergreen. It, things are changing on the ground. It's changing within the community. The resources that are coming in, uh, it, you know, are changing each day. And but one thing's for sure: the water, the the, the water crisis is real. The water is undrinkable. And we've got to continue to, to keep the people in mind, to keep to keep them as our focus, to look at what we need to do as a community, as social justice organizations, as governmental agencies to uh, rectify this situation uh, for the citizens of Jackson. And so as as this continues to unfold, Mississippi Center for Justice will continue uh, to engage uh, at each at, at, you know, with the community. And we will continue to uh, have discussions from within as to what, uh, how we should address these issues uh, moving forward. Well, I, I do, I really do appreciate you taking the time, and also appreciate the work that you're doing at the Mississippi Center for Justice and and the fight you're making uh, for a more equitable society. And and I uh, will stay in touch because you're in the midst of a real battle, not for people's lives not just for a better society, for actually people's lives. And so I want to thank you so much, Vangela Wade, for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. And good luck. Thank you, Mark, for having me. And we'll thank stay you. in touch. Absolutely. And, and I hope all of you out there have enjoyed this conversation. And once again, I want to thank you all for joining us. And please let me know what you thought about what you heard today and what you'd like us to cover. Just write to me at mss at therealnews.com. I'll get right back to you. And if you have an extra minute, Stay there. Go to therealnews.com forward slash support. Become a monthly donor and be, become part of the future with us. So for Stephen Frank, Dwayne Gladden, and Kayla Rivara, and the crew here at The Real News, I'm Mark Steiner. Stay involved, keep listening, and take care.